Not my story, but one my mom told me from her 20s when she was living and working in London. I'll do my best to retell it. This story always gives me the creeps, though, when I find myself thinking about it. So back in her 20s, my mom was living in London and looking to move into a slightly bigger place. She'd found a really good price for a flat slightly out from the area she was hoping to find. She'd called the agent to book a viewing, and that's when things turned odd. The guy booking the viewing started asking weird questions, requests, such as to bring her passport, what's her age, race, and physical appearance. Would she be coming on her own? Did she have a car? Or would she be taking the bus? Very persistent in his askings, and steadfast in the fact that she should arrive by bus, as it would be easiest for her explaining it was a straight road from the bus stop to the apartment block. Obviously quite unnerved by this call, but still interested, because the flat looked ideal. She and my dad, who were dating at the time, decided to check the exterior and surrounding area. The day before the viewing, they drove there, first passing the bus stop he was indicating to her to arrive via. From the bus stop, there was about 150, maybe 200 meters of derelict wasteland, that she would have to walk past to get to the flat. And standing at the end of the street in the location this apartment block should have been was a huge abandoned building. Smashed windows, graffiti, no entry signs, the whole lot. Definitely nothing inhabitable in sight. Still, when she tells us today, you can see how much it rightly shook her. Of course, she didn't go to her viewing, However, she did inform the police advising them of the planned time and place. From what she saw, and from following up with them, they didn't appear to take this tip seriously in the least, and very little was done. A couple of years later, while in a pub with some friends, she gets chatting to a guy she just met through mutual friends that night. He was in the police, and through conversation, her story came up. He said that that area at the time of her viewing had a huge human trafficking problem. Stories of people being lured to places that they had no actual reason to be, simply for the sake of robbing, kidnapping, or worse. The guy spoke of several instances of both men and women being drawn to that area under the guise of housing accommodation or work, just to find their way there one day and then to never be seen again. This man all but confirmed in my mother's opinion that something terrible would have happened had she shown up that day. Not that she needed any further confirmation, but it drove home just how right she was to check out the location beforehand and not to just trust the housing promises of a stranger. So a few years ago, I lived in an apartment complex in San Antonio, Texas. I was 26 at the time, and I'm female. I lived there for about four years with a couple of my best friends. So over the years, I would run in a neighborhood that was close to our apartment complex. I've actually had a couple of weird things happen to me throughout the years running there, as well as at our complex. But this event was the most terrifying moment of my life, and it caused me to stop running in that neighborhood altogether until life finally found my friends and I moving to different cities. Over the years of running, I became familiar with this one house that gave serious trap house vibes. It was out of place for the neighborhood, as there was an elementary school just up the street, and it was far from a high crime area. It was a corner house that was at the first stop sign of my running path, so the closest corner to my apartment, and housed a group of about six rather large men. That's usually about how many I would see together at a time, at least. They always had people coming and going, sounded like they were throwing a never-ending party, and their property smelled strongly of weed. As a woman and avid watcher of crime documentaries, I'm constantly paranoid and observant of my surroundings, which is why I'd come to know that house all so well. Throughout the years, I'd always managed to see them, but they never saw me. However, in the last year that we lived there, that all changed. Just so you know, it wasn't dark out during this event. The sun was out, 
shining brightly. It was maybe 5.30 p.m. or so. I'm at the start of my path and I'm coming up to the first stop sign in their house. Per usual, I look for them and their vehicle and any potential traffic and I notice that they aren't home. They only had one vehicle, a big black Tahoe that they would all pile into, so it made it pretty easy to know if someone was home or not. I continue on my run, which takes me further up past that house into another neighborhood where I would run around a cul-de-sac a few times before running back down that same path. I'd say about an hour and a half passes by and then I decide to head home before the sun starts to fade and it gets dark. As I'm running home and coming up to that house and the stop sign, I'm listening to music, but I notice that I'll probably need to stop at the stop sign because of traffic. As I hit the corner, that puts this house to the right of me and the stop sign for the four-way intersection to the left of me. I credit what happened next to trusting my instincts, remaining observant, and being in band and softball. I was honestly really tired from my run, so I was kind of looking down at the ground rather than ahead. But I always utilize my peripheral vision. Shout out to being a band nerd. If you know, you know. As the traffic clears, I take off to run across the street to the sidewalk that will take me to a fence on the side of my apartment complex. It didn't have a door. I would just either hop it or slide under to run down that path. I see that the vehicle that had been stopped at the stop sign perpendicular to me is a vehicle that I know to belong to the house that was just on the right of me. Out of the corner of my eye, I see them turn like they're going to go down their street when I think, hmm, that turn seemed too wide to be a U-turn, which is weird since their house is right there. I take all of two tired steps I was nearly out of energy at this point, before I get this sinking gut feeling. I've never in my life felt this feeling before, but immediately, I felt danger course at my back, and everything in my body and mind told me to run for my life. I didn't fight the feeling, I just did. With that inkling of fear in my stomach and danger down my back, I sprinted down the sidewalk with renewed vigor and slid under the fence like I was sliding to home plate. I immediately popped up and turned around to look outside the fence, where I had just been, and I saw them. The group of men that I had only ever seen in passing were sitting in their car on the street outside of my apartment complex fence, with their windows down, and all six of them staring directly at me. We stared at each other for what seemed like a long time before I watched them drive away, And once they were out of sight, I ran like hell to my apartment and locked myself inside, scared to show them exactly where my apartment was, as I was worried they were circling the complex looking for me. I told my friends what happened and spent the rest of the night full of adrenaline, pacing and reflecting on what had happened. Those men purposely chose not to go home, but rather pull a U-turn to follow me as I ran. Recounting the story over the years... I've had people tell me it was so they could view my butt as I ran, but when I remember that feeling in my body, there was almost a voice in my head yelling at me to run like my life depended on it, and think to their blank faces and dark eyes staring at me from inside that vehicle. I seriously question what their true intentions were that day. Glad to never actually find out. It was April of 2008. I was 20 and living in Denver for a year-long work contract with a non-profit in Boulder. My girlfriend, now wife, and my best friend Tim drove to Colorado from our home state to visit me for my 21st birthday. The non-profit I was working for housed their workers in dorm rooms, and drinking wasn't allowed on site. Nor were visitors allowed to stay overnight. So I booked a hotel room in downtown Denver for the weekend where we could drink in honor of my 21st. The hotel was big, very nice, and in a safe central area of the city. So nice, in fact, that it was the same hotel that most of the politicians would later stay at during the Democratic National Convention of 2008 that took place in Denver later that summer. My wife and Tim arrived Saturday morning, and we all met up at the hotel. The day was fantastic. We drank our way across the city most of the day, 
by about 1 a.m. we got back to the hotel. The room was typical, with two queen beds. Bed number one was close to a big window, looking out across the city. Bed number two was pushed against the wall with a door that opened to the bathroom. You couldn't see the door or entryway to the room unless you were at the foot of bed number one. We drank more and chatted in the room until about 4 a.m. My wife was laying at the head of bed number two, flipping through the TV channels. Tim and I were seated at the foot of bed number one, staring out the window as we talked. As we spoke, I heard some movement and the sound of a door opening. Without looking away from the window, I had assumed that it was my wife getting up to use the bathroom. A few minutes passed by and I thought I heard movement once more, so I finally turned around to look. I saw my wife still lounging in bed number two, as she had been. Did you get up a few minutes ago and use the bathroom? I asked her. Her response? No. I thought I heard a door, I said back to her with her just looking confused back at me. Yeah, I thought I heard that too, Tim said, breaking his own gaze from the window. It was then I started to run cold and sobered up pretty quickly. Very softly, I heard Tim say, I think there's someone in our room. I lurched forward from the foot of the bed to look into the pitch black entryway. I could barely make it out, and I wanted to believe so hard that I wasn't seeing it. But there was a man, dressed in all black with a baseball cap, pressed into the 90 degree corner of the entryway, where the room door and wall met. Absolute silence fell on the room, and it felt like hours passed by as I started to panic in my mind like no way I ever have in my entire life. We all knew. We knew we weren't alone and hadn't been for a while. And he knew that we had spotted him. Eventually, Tim got the courage to meekly speak in the direction of the entryway and said, Hey man, is there something we can help you with? Another period of silence that felt like an eternity went by. He slumped off the edge of the wall a little bit, into the light, and made eye contact with Tim and I. We all just stared at each other. Then eventually he spoke up and said, Is this room 1709? No, man, it's not, Tim said, stroking his beard nervously. The man stared at us a while longer, raising his eyebrows and shaking his head. He then turned around and unceremoniously left. We then erupted into a million curse words and paced around the room. I called the front desk. They told me that he was drunk and they found him in the stairwell, but directed him back to the right room. Minutes later, Tim called the front desk, and they told him that he was not a guest. He had been apprehended in the stairwell and taken into police custody. Then a while later, they told my wife he disappeared into the night, and they had no idea who he was or what he was doing. They also told her that there was no room 1709 in the hotel. So we got three different stories entirely. We still have no idea what that was all about, or how he managed to get a key card to our room. We were absolutely sure that the door was closed. It was easily the most terrifying moment of my life. Always use the latch in hotel rooms. We got the stay refunded, and about $200 in credit for food from the hotel. I think we should have sued, but we were young and dumb. Just glad to get out of there unscathed. I'm a new mother, and while I feel like this goes without saying, my daughter means the world to me. This happened when she was almost one year old. We were grocery shopping in the fruits and vegetable section of Fred's. It had been a normal day up to this point. Some people waved at her, some smiled, a few others sent kind words her way. My daughter was enjoying interacting with passerbys, but then, out of the corner of my eye, I see a man trying to communicate with my daughter. He made sounds loud enough to get her attention, yet quiet enough that I wouldn't hear. I only saw because he was making some weird kissy face at her as he did. Something about it felt terribly off. 
Usually people will interact with her while making it very obvious to me, but this guy was making an effort to stay just out of my eyesight while keeping his eyes directly on my daughter. I'd never experienced anything like this before. I was alone and unsure of what to do, so I just left that section of the store and tried to forget about it. Later on, while checking out, I saw once more that man. He was right behind me, in the checkout lane next to mine, staring wide-eyed with a blank expression at my daughter. I froze. I recall the lady checking out, asking if someone was making me uncomfortable, but I was so shaken up I couldn't get the words out. She did call for an escort for me, and an employee walked us to the car as I maniacally scanned the rows of cars. The employee loaded my car up as I buckled in my daughter, and patiently waited till I locked my doors and drove off before they went inside. I'm willing to think that perhaps I was overthinking things, but that sense of terror, especially as a mother, is something that I'll never forget. In the fourth grade, I had a female teacher that took a special interest in me. She would often give me coveted roles like calling attendance or delivering papers to the office. I didn't think much about it because I was a responsible kid at that age. I've always been a bit of an old soul. She had given us an assignment to compose a persuasive essay. Naturally, being the nerdy, old soul kid I was, I wrote my essay on abortion. When all the papers had been turned in and reviewed, we went to the library one afternoon for a special reading of the essays. She told us she had all our names on slips of paper, and she would draw out a few names to read their essay. And somehow, my name came up first. I wasn't a particularly gifted child in athletics or even academics, but I loved to read and write. I was ecstatic my name was first chosen. I remember she had the biggest smile as I read my essay. That afternoon, my friends told me that they saw that she had been holding the first slip of paper in her hand before she ever said anything about drawing names, but she played it off like she drew my name by chance. At some point of that year, my memory of how much time lapsed here is vague. I had stopped to use the restroom by the teacher's lounge. At that time, 30 to 35 years ago, things were very different in schools. Kids and teachers used the same restroom. The principal would literally give you a spanking on your birthday. Never indecent, but you'd get a cool pencil afterwards, so we all tolerated it. Anyway, that day I had gone to the bathroom and was at the sink washing my hands after finishing my business. Suddenly, my teacher emerged from a stall and walked up to wash her hands at the sink too. She was happy to see me and started sharing how much she loved having me in her class and some other gushy type stuff that made me feel uncomfortable. I became fixated on washing my hands. She dried her hands on the towel and walked back up to me. I was stuck between her, the sink, and the wall. There was nowhere to go. She stared at me in the mirror and said, You're always such a good girl, aren't you? Then she slapped my butt and grabbed one of my cheeks. She smiled at me in the mirror, and like a flip of a switch, she let go and said, See you in class, and left. I honestly was in shock. I never told anyone what had happened. I didn't even know if someone would believe me if I did. I spent the rest of my year doing everything I could to fade into the background, and never ever did I use that restroom again. One quick edit that I have to make. After looking back into my old elementary yearbooks, it was the sixth grade that this happened, not the fourth. I'm not sure why I felt like I was younger than I was when it happened. All I can conclude is that this whole experience made me feel smaller younger, and more fragile than I had actually been at that point. I've had a few creepy things happen to me in my lifetime, but this one, this one I still think about how things could have gone so wrong, so very fast. I'm a 20 year old female. This takes place back when I used to live in Southern Indiana. Like, seriously in the sticks. It was a weekend evening, 
and my best friend and I were coming home after our graveyard shift at a local waffle joint. She decided to go get her dog from her house so we could stay at my place for the night. That's important for later. So we begin our journey, heading out into the country where I live. To get to my house, there's a long, narrow dirt road that you have to go down. About a mile in or so, we see a truck's headlights. We get closer. It's a nice truck. I don't know much about cars, but this truck looked rather new. He's parked to where he's sideways, blocking the whole dirt path. Confused, I ease my car to a stop and get out to ask if he's okay. He looked hopeful when he saw me at first. Oh, I'm just waiting on a friend to come get me. My truck stuck. He smiled at me and I noticed his pupils were nearly completely dilated. He looks back to my car and sees that I have someone with me. He looks at the dog sticking his head out the window as well. His smile begins to fade. He says, pit bulls are mean and nasty. He quickly turns around and gets back into his truck. I take this break in the conversation to realize just how odd this interaction is already. I head back to the driver's side, put my own car back in reverse, and use whatever GTA driving skills I've picked up over the years to get us out of there. So we take my poor 95 caddy that really shouldn't be driving on a dirt road anyway, backtrack our path all the way down that road, and get back to the main road. Relieved, we take an alternate route to my house. But lo and behold, the same guy is parked on that road, standing off to the side, just smiling, looking straight into our headlights as we pass. We were about to shit ourselves as we gunned it the rest of the way to my house. I don't know how he got there before us, I don't know what his intentions were, but I'm glad that I wasn't alone being that typical naive college girl. At first, I wasn't going to post this to Reddit, because I do find my own situation hard to believe in and of itself, so I can see why others may not believe it at all. But then I realized that it doesn't matter and I may need some advice. I'm a 25-year-old woman if that background helps at all. Firstly, this occurred two weeks ago. I live in kind of a big house with my dad who lives at the opposite end of it. Our house is at the end of a driveway with three homes sharing this driveway. The important context here is that my neighbor in front of my house is a drug dealer. I've lived here my entire life and he's been dealing drugs down there my entire life. So two weeks ago, on a Thursday evening around 8.30 p.m., I'm in my bedroom, which is located close to my front door. Suddenly, I see lights in my window. Look out the curtains to see an old blue and green pickup truck slowly driving up the driveway and stopping near my window. I thought it could have been a late delivery person, but it was strange that they were in an old truck, in addition to it being so late at night. I had the TV on loud and was getting dressed to go and see if there's a delivery when I hear a man's voice from inside my house. I couldn't make out what he was saying. I'm in my room with the doors closed and he's in the next room over, my living room. I wasn't freaked out at first because I thought it was my dad coming to tell me someone was here. I started yelling over the TV, Dad, is that you? I couldn't hear what the person was saying and I'm simultaneously trying to find the remote to turn the TV down. Once the TV's turned down though, I hear the words, delivery, and can I come in? Coming from right outside my bedroom door. I'm scared shitless now because I know it isn't my dad and probably not a delivery person either. This person started turning the doorknob to my bedroom door as I ran to the other side of my bed to find my pepper spray. That door never opened. I had the pepper spray held at a man's eye level as I opened the door ready to blast him and run to the other side of my house to find my dad. But there was no one there when I opened my bedroom door, and now my front door was shut as well. I go get my dad, and he comes into the living room. We look out the window as the truck slowly backs up into my neighbor's driveway. 
He sat there for a single minute with his lights on, as we just watched. It was dark and there was no way to see the license plate on the truck. He pulled off slowly after a minute or so, but it was so strange that he even stayed. I didn't call the police because I was told by people around me that it was pointless, since there was nothing they could do. But now that I'm thinking more about it, I do have a description of the vehicle and what he did was illegal, right? I suppose my door must have been accidentally left unlocked, but I don't think that means you can just walk into somebody's home. I'm thinking of calling and reporting it, even if that's just so there's something written on paper about this. Oh, and obviously there were no packages left. I'd appreciate any advice on the subject. I think I was around 9 or 10 years old when this happened and I remember it pretty clearly. This happened at school. It was lunch break, which lasted for about an hour. I was with a group of friends, and we were playing like pretty much any other day. But we started to notice people in front of the school. And when I mean people, I mean about 20 of them. On a typical day, there wouldn't be anybody outside of the school, so this absolutely stood out. They all had their phones in their hands. A woman approached the entry of the school and she started taking pictures of every kid that she saw. We could easily tell that this is what she was doing because we could see the flash. A yard teacher or some other adult in our school went to see her and asked her to stop, but she didn't. Instead, she just smiled this terrifying smile at him and said something that I couldn't hear, but it looked kind of like when a mother comforts you in a, it's going to be okay sort of way. It's about this point that the teacher begins to look mad because, well, taking photos of children that aren't yours, that's pretty weird. I don't think it's illegal, but still very odd. Eventually, she sort of slunk away, back into the group from whence she came. But the behavior didn't stop because everyone else in front of the school was also taking pictures of the children. Each and every person was doing this some more discreet than others. I remember a man pretending to make a call, but when he held the phone up to his ear, his flash was on as well. So actually it was rather obvious that he was recording too. As kids, we didn't really pick up on how weird this was. We thought it was fun and sort of a game. We began hiding behind playground equipment, trying to make the dash from here to there, in between odd photographs being taken of us. We only truly realized the seriousness of this when one of the strangers tried to make entry through the playground gate. This gate was simply waist high, with a latch that could be undone from either side. While he wasn't able to swiftly undo the latch, I remember thinking in the moment that he could have easily hopped it and been in the playground with all of us kids in a snap. This is when the headmaster of the school got involved yelling at each and every one of the strangers congregated on the sidewalk for about 10 minutes, demanding to know what they were doing while simultaneously calling the police. The headmaster later told us herself that all those people had been part of a religion that believed in voodoo, and that if they took pictures of us, they could sell the pictures, make us suffer, what have you. To be honest, everyone mostly laughed, but... None of the parents seem to share the same sentiment about this whole endeavor. To this day, I don't know if what she said was true. I don't know if some people were arrested. I don't know what the pictures became. The thing that I remember the most is that woman's smile, though. It absolutely creeped me out. Even today, the concept of being photographed by friends or even close family members still just makes me really uncomfortable. I suppose I need to thank that group of strangers for making me this way. Thanks a lot. So this happened almost 20 years ago, when I was a young 15-year-old girl. I had an older neighbor who taught drums and was a friend of my family's, and I would take drum lessons with him once a week. He only lived about two blocks away, so I'd always walk to his house. He and his family lived at the end of a cul-de-sac. Well, one summery day, 
when I was walking home. Couldn't have been later than 4 p.m. Broad daylight in a quiet neighborhood. There was a strange man standing across from the end of the cul-de-sac. He had on a big cowboy hat, odd for my area in and of itself, and some facial hair. I don't know, he was maybe in his 30s. He was just staring at me. He was watching me unabashedly as I walked down the cul-de-sac and crossed the street. Once my back was to him, I could hear that he was following me. My heart sped up. My drumsticks seemed like weak protection, and I was wearing these thin little flip-flops and remember thinking that if I had to kick him, they weren't going to help me at all. Less than half a block away from me was a more busy street, and I remembered thinking that if I could just get there, where people would see, he'd be sure to back off. But his step sounded closer, and I could taste my panic knowing that I wasn't going to make it. I ended up running up a driveway to a house where I kind of knew the family, and I knew the mom with young kids was probably there so I pounded on her door. In my haste, I even tried to open it myself. That was the level of my panic. She opened the door and I spilled into her house and locked the door behind me, told her what had happened and let my heart calm down just a little bit. After being inside for about 15 minutes, I asked if I could just hop her back fence to go home, since it would cut out a block of travel. But when we slid the drapes of her back door open, The dude was leaning against the fence, right outside of her house, where he could see both the front door as well as the back. She ended up loading her kids in the car and driving me home herself, and later had her husband ask around. Turned out the dude was living with his mother and had just gotten out of jail. I don't know what the charges were. All I know is that my stomach had been twisted in knots and it was the first time I'd tasted fear like that. I don't know what would have happened if he'd caught me, although it's something out of my nightmares to find out. Now this is a story that I'd really like to talk about, just to be sure that everyone is cautious and stays level-headed at all times. For context, I lived in the middle of nowhere in Canada. It was an old town that had quite a few abandoned buildings due to absence of residents. Me and many of my friends were tired of the lack of entertainment options for us. So what we did was explore these abandoned buildings. Prior to the experience I'm about to talk about, we never had anything too crazy happen to us. Occasionally, we'd see a small bit of blood-like liquid, and we did see a pentagram on the ground from someone who went to a house previously. But nothing too bad, like I said before. Until the last time I had gone exploring these abandoned buildings. Now, when I was younger... I used to go to a daycare that was also part of a mental hospital. Weird combination, I know. It closed down due to lack of patients and also a lack of children at the daycare. I decided to go back there with my friends a few years back. For a little more context, I was 15 when this happened. Most of my friends were about the same age. When we did get there, it was rather cliche. There was fog, it was rather dark and there was a light drizzle of rain. We went to the main gate, which was of course padlocked shut. We decided to help each other hop over it and made a ton of noise while doing so. We were laughing and giggling the whole time, unsuspecting of what was to come. We looked around the small play place with flashlights we had brought. Even with our somewhat powerful flashlights, our visibility was rather limited. We decided to enter the decaying building Glass and dirt crunched under our feet as we stepped into the daycare section of the complex. There were still old Legos, wood chips from previous furniture, old torn dolls, and toys strewn all about. The further we walked around the daycare, we naturally became more and more silent, until all we could hear was the crunch of dirt beneath our feet. I found some crayons in a plastic container in the corner of the room. I walked over to pick them up, when all of a sudden we heard a loud crash coming from behind a metal door that led to the psych ward part of the building. My friends and I all looked at each other. As a whole, we were a group of five. Most of us were very bold and cocky. Our staring match lasted a few moments before our friend Brian suggested we go and look to see where the sound came from. Personally, 
I wasn't too fond of the idea. But with my group of friends, there was no way anyone was going to decline such a thing. We all stacked up on the door and opened it. It was rusted to the floor and we had to heave to get it open. As we walked in, the metallic smells and must became stronger, with a hint of something else that I just couldn't put my finger on at that moment. We walked in, our flashlights pointed in every direction, with Brian leading the group. The hallways were tight, and to the left and right were the occasional metal doorways, some with doors still open. I couldn't help but feel slightly claustrophobic, and it felt just a touch hard to breathe. As we continued, Brian shone his flashlight into a room and recoiled in an instant. We all stopped walking as Brian slowly entered the room. What is it? I whispered. I thought I saw someone in here. It seems fine now, though. To be honest, I thought he was just messing with us to increase the general anxiety level in the room. But looking back, I think he was being completely honest. He backed out of the room and we continued walking deeper into the psych ward, when another friend swiftly told us to stop. We came to a halt and just listened. In the distance ahead of us, we heard the subtle pitter-patter of footsteps echo throughout the hall. We all looked at each other once more, fear in each of our eyes. Brian continued walking towards the sound. We considered turning back for just a second without Brian, wondering if some ghost or something was in the building with us. But we couldn't do that to him. The closer we got, the more it felt like we were being watched. When finally we entered a room on the right which had the smell of rotting meat, in front of us was a dead deer. Its innards were spilled all over the floor, staining the concrete. A friend of mine had a very weak stomach and lost his lunch all over the floor right then and there. That's when we heard whispering from somewhere about. Brian shone his flashlight to the corner of the room where a man with short hair was standing with his head down. He wore a bright green shirt, stained with what I only could assume was blood, and torn beige pants. He didn't have any socks and his feet seemed damaged. He was twitching sporadically and continued to mumble even after we saw him. We stared at him for a solid 30 seconds before he made his first true movement. He looked up at us, with a haunting grin affixed to his face. This sent shivers down all of our collective spines. You guys here for the feast? He said each word with varying inflection and energy. This kicked us over the edge and we bolted out of that room, all the way back to the daycare center. The door was still open and we decided to try and slam it shut, but... The rust and pure weight of the door almost kept it open. It took three of us pulling with all of our strength to close it. And just before we did, I could still see the silhouette of the man watching us, his white teeth being the only other human feature that I could see. We sat behind that metal door catching our breath for a second, all looking at each other for some confirmation that we all saw the same thing. After a little bit of labored breathing from each of us, we heard a light tapping on the door. That's when we decided that it was time to leave. We booked it out of the vicinity completely and ran all the way home. A year after we visited that spot, we heard that police went back to do a routine search of the area and found that man. It was stated that this guy used to be in the psych ward before it had closed down. He escaped the facility he was transferred to and lived off the wildlife around the complex. When the cops brought him in, he had a series of sicknesses and ailments brought on from eating raw meat. His mental condition was much worse than before. Of course, there were further rumors that he killed someone in the forest while searching for food, but none of that has ever been confirmed. In the end, guys, just be careful, especially in dangerous areas such as abandoned buildings that you're exploring. And creepy dude, while I pray that you've gotten better, I do hope that we never meet again. This story took place when I was 18. I was driving home late one night in less than stellar conditions. 
It was snowy and, while I'd struggled to call it a blizzard, it certainly felt like it in the moment. I couldn't see very well, so I decided to pull over and wipe my headlights, taillights, and any snow that had amassed on my windshield. As I'm doing this, I hear the crunch of snow from behind me. I turn and I see this guy running towards me, yelling at me all the while. He catches up to my car and asks if he can get a ride to the bus station. But the thing is, is that buses don't operate this late at night in my area. And I knew this. My heart immediately began racing in this situation. I'm too polite for my own good. It's snowing and I generally feel bad for the guy, but luckily I'm smart enough to know that something was up. I told him, oh, I'm not going in that direction. Sorry. He was so adamant about me taking him though, saying it's not far, he just really needed to catch a bus into so-and-so town, and that his mom needed him home. Please, could I help him out? I told him no, sorry, I really couldn't, and I needed to get going, as I ran back to the driver's side of my car. I took off immediately, just staring at him through my rearview mirror. He watches me for a moment as I inch down the road, and then he runs back in the same direction that he came from, getting into the passenger side of a van. All those stories you hear about creepy vans, and here I am in the midst of one. I'm thinking this can't be real. The van begins driving in my direction, and at that point I turn onto a busy road. Well, as busy as one can be that late at night. To my relief, that van didn't make the same turn as I did. I drove the rest of the way home terrified that night, peeking in my rearview mirror the entire way. I never drove that late at night again let alone pull over in some dark neighborhood. I'm positive that something was going to go down that night if I decided to give him a ride. Why did he not just grab me? I still don't know, although I get shivers just thinking about it. Have you ever gotten the feeling that you've run into pure evil? Like you've met a real wolf in sheep's clothing? Someone that appears outwardly normal until they open their mouth and you realize that's far from the case. I, a 25-year-old female, was waiting for my at-the-time boyfriend to finish work. He worked at a pub in our city as a chef. I would finish work earlier than him and have a drink and sometimes talk to the locals who frequented that bar. One day, I was outside on the balcony having a cigarette and this guy came out and asked if he could join me. He seemed as normal as could be. Normal clothing, tidy hair. You could walk past him in the street and not notice him one bit. I said sure and handed him a lighter. All seemed normal. I felt safe as the balcony had a lot of people sitting around drinking as well. Conversation was typical. He asked what I did. I asked what he did. He was an orderly at the hospital. He randomly said something like, don't you just wish the balcony would collapse and everyone fall and get crushed? I was absolutely shocked. I laughed a little out of uncomfortability, but I thought that maybe he had a very dark sense of humor. I tried to change the subject and started asking about his work. I remember looking around for my then boyfriend. He wasn't finished yet, but I hoped that he was. Asking about that was a mistake. He told me that he would often go to the rooms where people were in long-term comas and mess with them. To be honest, I thought he was just reusing a storyline from the Kill Bill movie. But the way he talked about it, and his eyes went weird, it was like he was excited to tell someone. His eyes were wild when he spoke. He had the creepiest smile when he started talking about it and staring off while rambling about wanting to kill one of them in their coma. At this point, I freak out jump up and excuse myself, saying that I need to go to the bathroom. I found one of the bouncers and had this man removed. As he was being taken out, I was standing at the door watching to make sure that he left. He started screeching and pointing at me over the mountain of a man bouncer who was almost carrying him out at this point. He was saying, you laughed. When the balcony collapsed, you laughed. You're in on this too. It's your fault. I felt gross and dirty after this and tried to block it out of my memory. 
I should have said something to someone, but I never did. I didn't even tell my boyfriend. I just wanted this man and his crazy eyes to disappear. This all happened a handful of years ago. We had a transfer come on the team from another department within our company. He was nearly completely deaf, meaning he could hear really, really loud noises, but nothing else. He did quite well speaking out loud, and he read lips to understand what was being said to him. No big deal. His addition simply required one easy adjustment of making sure that you faced him while talking, and two, that only one person spoke at a time. He was a decent team member in the beginning, but after a while, began making comments to me and the only other female on the team. Things like, why haven't you made the coffee yet? And just other stupid old school quote jokes that made fun of women. My role gave him instructions on customer requests and needs. He would often simply not follow the instructions and I would get calls from the customers complaining. Just as often, this meant that I had to let him know that he had to go back and fix the work so it matched the original request. Afterwards, he would storm into my office and yell at me as if his inability to read and follow instructions was my fault. I got tired of it and said, do your job right the first time and there wouldn't be any complaints. This of course didn't go over well with him. His anger was unnerving. I got the feeling it wasn't going to stop there either. In the following weeks, he would intentionally block doorways I would be trying to go through. One time, I was in the other female worker's small office, and he blocked the entire doorway. Stood there and smiled this super creepy smile as if he was saying, What are you going to do about it? I refused to touch him to try and push past him. The other lady kept looking at me like she was beyond uncomfortable as well. It was like we read each other's minds and... We kept having our own conversation about something work-related, as we ignored him. After several minutes of this, he finally left. Another time I had to go to the far back of the warehouse to organize some stuff in the room. I remember going in and thinking, okay, there are two cameras and they can see this main hallway, but not between the shelving units. I had this uneasy feeling that he would emerge while I was back there. Sure enough. A few minutes later, he came barging in the room and came right at me. I had already been on high alert, so I quickly exited the other door in the room and booked it back to where the rest of the team was. I pulled up the security cameras to see if he had a reason to be in there, just to see him pacing in the room for a few moments after I bolted, before he left as well. He clearly had no reason to be in there at that exact moment that I was. I shared this with a male co-worker friend and he said he would go back with me to any of the spaces away from the main team areas. I had to get my work done, but I didn't trust that I could do it without this angry guy finding me. Anytime we would make comments about his anger or demeaning jokes, the managers would say, oh, maybe he didn't understand because you talk too fast. Or maybe it's just a big misunderstanding. As if having a disability means you can't also be a disgusting human being. Not too long after that, I heard from a teammate that this angry guy had grabbed the other female's upper thigh, literally right below her private area, squeezed and said, does this make you uncomfortable? And then laughed. A few teammates witnessed it but didn't know what to do, as the other woman worker froze up. I immediately went to HR and told them everything he had been doing to intimidate, belittle, trap, and of course sexually harass. He was fired the very next day. When they escorted him out, he yelled, this is retaliation. HR asked me what I would make of that comment, and all I could think was it had to do with me standing my ground with him. I was so scared that he might show back up at the office unexpectedly. I told my family what he looked like, his tattoos, the car he drove, anything that would identify him since they had never met him. I blocked him from every social media platform as well. After he was let go, other females came forward and shared the things that he said or did to them too. They had told managers, but they had dismissed it because the guy is deaf and they didn't want to deal with any lawsuits. 
As much as I hate what he did to my coworker, I'm grateful it gave that final boost to get him fired. Hope I never run into that creep ever again. This story takes place during a bitter winter in the late 90s. At the time, I found myself navigating the treacheries of high school life. It was a somber season, and the night was much of the same. A relentless storm had unleashed its fury upon our town. I found myself doing a school assignment in the spare bedroom of our house, where an antiquated computer stood as my sole companion. Little did I know that within those four walls, a chilling chapter of my life would unfold. As the rain battered against the window, I sat hunched over the keyboard, diligently typing the final lines of a rather mundane book report. The atmosphere inside the room was heavy, filled with an unsettling silence, broken only by the pitter-patter of raindrops and the rhythmic clatter of my keystrokes. Outside of the single window in this room, the world appeared cloaked in darkness, our typically calm and tranquil backyard, obscured by a veil of relentless downpour. In a fleeting moment, my mother entered the room. Her presence was a brief break from the intensity of the storm. She gazed out into the night, her eyes fixed upon the storm that unfolded beyond the fragile barrier of our window. A sense of foreboding tinged her voice as she reminded me of the late hour and urged me to wrap up for the night. I acknowledged her request and with the completion of my laborious task, I began to shut down the computer. But as my fingers reached for the power button, a strange movement beyond the window caught my attention. My initial thought was that a stray cat had sought shelter from the rain. Its drenched figure served as a pitiful testament to the fury of the storm itself. However, as I peered closer, I had the feeling of dread park itself right in the center of my stomach. There. In the murky darkness, emerged a figure that defied all logical explanation. There was a man, tall and lanky, but with a mask covering most of his features. He stared back at me with eyes that seemed to penetrate my soul, and terror gripped my heart like icy talons as a blood-curdling scream left my throat, shattering what was once the stifling silence of the room. In an instant, I recoiled. My body propelled backward in a desperate bid to distance myself from the terrifying gaze that had locked onto my vulnerable form. My chair toppled over, its impact accentuated by the sound of my fear-stricken voice. My parents, who were alarmed by the commotion, surged into the room, their faces etched with a mix of concern and confusion. My father was the first to realize what was happening, and he wasted no time. Determination etched upon his face as he stormed out into the raging night. Through the downpour, he ventured into the shadows of our backyard, guided by a tenacious pursuit to unmask the intruder who had violated our privacy. And it was there, in our backyard, that he discovered some evidence. A trail of bicycle tracks leading away from our property and vanishing into the night. A chill raced down my spine as I began to put two and two together. The trespasser had not only infiltrated our backyard to peek through a single window, but it also possessed an intimate familiarity with the layout of our home and backyard. The realization struck with unrelenting force. This was far from a chance encounter. How many times had this pervy prowler peeked undetected? His unwelcome presence a sinister secret lurking in the shadows. The idea that my mother had stood at that very window a mere five minutes prior, just amplified this horror, plunged my fragile psyche into an abyss of paranoia. I think I slept on my parents' bedroom floor for a month after this. I know this might sound rather inconsequential, but until you have someone watching you with unknown intentions, don't be so quick to dismiss the creepiness of it all. I still have an intense fear of darkness to this very day and I'm more than a quarter century removed from this fateful night. This happened to me years ago, when I was around 19, maybe 20, and I worked retail part-time at the mall. I was at closing shift that night and left around 10.30 p.m. to head home. 
I often took the inside streets versus the freeway, which included a small stretch of back road that was usually pretty empty, especially during that time of night. This particular evening, I noticed the car about 10 minutes into my 30 minute drive home, heading the same way as me, but I didn't think much of it. As we're approaching the stretch of back road that's usually deserted at that time, the driver behind me begins flashing their high beams, slowing down and speeding up while tailgating me. I remember feeling panicked that they might even hit my car. Eventually, the car pulls up beside me and now I can see a middle-aged man who's pointing towards the back of my car and then motioning for me to roll my window down. I roll it down about halfway and I hear him say something about how my tire looks like it's flattening and I'm going to damage the rim if I don't pull over soon. I tell him that I don't know how to change a tire, but I'm not too far from home, so I should be fine. Although he's pretty insistent about how it'll only take a few moments and he'd be happy to help with the task. I know something is off because my car seems to be driving just fine. I politely say that I'm fine, but thanks anyway, and roll up my window. He drives next to me for what feels like forever, but it couldn't have been more than another minute or so. At this point, something feels so off that I'm even afraid to physically look in his direction. I focus on the road the best that I can, and eventually he slows down before moving behind me once again. After a few minutes, we reach a more populated and well-lit part of town, and I see him promptly make a U-turn. I get home and take a look, just to see that my tire is absolutely fine. I have no idea if he followed me from the mall or what that man's intentions were, but I think it's safe to say that they weren't anything good. I even had my dad check all my tires the next morning, including the tire pressure, and everything was within the normal range. I still think of this night from time to time, and it makes me nauseous to think about how different things might be today if I had decided to pull over that night. Back when I was 19, I used to tutor my 11-year-old neighbor for about a year in various school subjects. She was being raised by her bedridden aunt, who happened to ask me if I would be able to tutor her niece, who was struggling academically at the time. Me not knowing how to say no at that young age, I agreed to help. After helping the young lady and giving her many tips on how to study and improve her grades, we saw no need to continue the tutoring. Fast forward two years later, I had just given birth to my daughter six months prior. Around the same time, my cat had gone missing. Me being the cat lady that I am, I hung up several flyers around my neighborhood stating his description, the day he went missing, and a reward if he were to be returned to me. After posting up my last flyer, I noticed it was getting dark and decided to walk down the alleyway to go through my back door for it was the shortest way to my house from where I was. Upon being only six houses down from mine, I noticed a man in my periphery come up on my left and quickly turn around. He was short, kind of pudgy, and definitely staring at me. I greeted him with a hi. He said hello. What are you out here doing? I told him that I was looking for my missing cat and that I had been posting flyers around all day. Oh he says. Say, can I take you out for lunch sometime? Number one, this man was far from my type. Plus, I had just gotten out of a bad relationship after having my baby, so I really wasn't interested in even looking at men at this time. Also, my cat was missing, and that was really all I could think about. I found it kind of inconsiderate of him to try to use that moment as a way to come on to me. However, the most alarming part about this interaction no matter how many times I politely declined, was his unrelenting gaze as he was talking to me. It literally felt like he was undressing me with his eyes. At that time, I had never felt so uncomfortable in my entire life. I had never even felt a man look at me that way before. The sky was growing even darker with each passing moment. I almost felt like he might try to snatch me. I was terrified and just when I thought things might take a turn for the worst, I heard my mother shouting my name out the back window. 
I immediately yelled back in reply and sprinted back to the house. I told her about the encounter that I had just had and she was absolutely livid. The last thing she said about that situation was, stay away from that man. Something doesn't seem right with him. This was something that she definitely didn't have to tell me because the first few seconds of that encounter told me everything that I needed to know. From that point on, I took heed to my mother's words and my own gut feelings. But unfortunately, I wasn't the only person that this man attempted to prey upon. Remember my 11-year-old neighbor? Being as though her aunt was bedridden, as I previously stated, her only way of getting to school was by catching a ride with one of her aunt's friends. The person typically tasked with taking the girl to school wasn't able to one day. So the aunt had to ask this creepy dude, who was apparently another friend of the family. Little did the aunt know, this creep wouldn't even take her niece to school. Instead, he took her to his house, where he essayed her repeatedly, for the entire day that she was supposed to be in school. After hearing this story, I was completely shaken. And honestly, looking back on all of this, I can't help but think of what could have happened to me had my mother not hollered my name out the window when she did. While I personally never saw that man again, the image of him and his gaze are burned into my memory forever, and my heart still aches to this day for my little neighbor. In the early 1980s, I was working a couple of jobs in Palm Springs, California, including helping my mother manage a small hotel. One of our long-term guests was a man named Raymond. He was tall, had dark hair, and a noticeable accent. Raymond always seemed friendly and sociable, but he never allowed us to clean his room. Whenever I asked, he would politely say, mm, maybe tomorrow. I spoke to our maid one day who confirmed that she had never cleaned Raymond's room herself. He would generously tip her to give him privacy. Concerned about this, I informed my mother about the situation. She decided that when Raymond left for work, we would seize the opportunity to do a quick cleanup in the room. The next morning, as we sipped our coffee, we waited for Raymond to leave. Once he was gone, we armed ourselves with cleaning supplies and fresh sheets and my mother unlocked his door to peek inside. Her face instantly turned pale. She quickly shut and locked the door once more. Startled, I asked her what was wrong. She didn't answer me though. She quietly retreated to the office and picked up the phone to call 911. As she made this call, another one of our guests entered the small lobby seeking assistance with directions. This became an extended conversation for myself although I couldn't help but wonder what was happening in the back of the office. When I returned, my mother was sitting there nervously, waiting for me. I asked her what had happened, but before she could respond, a few police officers began filing silently into the room. They exchanged nods with my mother and followed her to Raymond's room, guns drawn. Confused and concerned, I asked my mother what was going on she simply gestured for me to sit beside her, and together we watched as the police emerged from the room with about 20 people in tow. I couldn't fathom how such a small space could accommodate so many people. After the commotion had settled, the police rejoined us in the office. They had been searching for Raymond for a long time. Turned out he was a dangerous human smuggler known as a coyote, facilitating the illegal crossing of borders. As we anxiously awaited Raymond's return from work, the police remained in the office strategizing. When Raymond finally pulled up, he stepped out of his car, turned the corner towards his room, and he quickly found himself surrounded, captured from both sides by the law. As soon as the cuffs went on, all of the lawmen seemed to breathe a huge sigh of relief, as it was obvious that Raymond's reign had come to an end. Once Raymond was hauled away and the room was cleared of all evidence, including copious stacks of money and a few guns, 
my mother and I ventured inside. The sight that greeted us was repulsive and haunting. The room was utterly filthy, a putrid den of squalor. We had to remove everything, scrub every inch, and fumigate the entire space. Mountains of trash were carelessly strewn across the kitchen floor, necessitating its disposal. Carpets were soiled beyond salvation, demanding professional cleaning. Sheets, blankets, and towels, once symbols of comfort, were irreparably tainted and discarded. It took three of us more than two full days of relentless work to restore the room to a habitable state. What haunted us the most out of this entire situation was the realization that Raymond had skillfully disguised his true nature beneath a facade of friendliness and charm. Unbeknownst to us, he had been using our hotel as a hub to smuggle people right beneath our noses. We had been deceived, lured into his web of treachery, oblivious to the danger that lurked within our midst. Even as all this unfolded, as cop cars came and went, as dozens were ushered off of our property, I can easily say that we never saw this coming. In July of 2015, I was on a hike with my husband and two of our friends. We also had our dog with us just for a little bit of background. We live in western Washington state, and at that time of year, it stays lightish until between 9 and 10 p.m. It was about 7.30 as I remember, as we headed up. The trail peaks at a beautiful lake, with a loop trail that brings you back to the original trail in order to descend. Light or not, it was late enough in the evening that many people passed us on their way down as we made our way up. You can see the entirety of the lake from the top of the trail, and we were clearly the last people headed up there. As we made our way back down, it was beginning to get dark out. Strangely, we crossed paths with a man making his way up towards the lake. He wasn't dressed in a way that would suggest he was camping or even hiking for that matter. He had regular sneakers, a t-shirt and shorts, no water, no pack, nothing. We tried to make conversation, but he wouldn't speak or even make eye contact with us. My dog whined and whined, sniffed his feet and wanted to run back to him as we passed. I had to call her back several times. The whole interaction seemed rather odd. We couldn't shake the feeling that he was incredibly out of place. About 25 minutes later, we hear a single loud boom off in the distance, and we immediately know what had transpired. We made it to the parking lot of the trail, and we saw one remaining car. We assumed that it must have been his. It was unlocked, and there was an envelope on the driver's seat, both of which we observed through the window. We didn't mess with the door. We notified the ranger that stayed in a cabin at the edge of the parking lot, who said that he'd call the police, but he wasn't risking running into a cougar to go up there to check on the guy. He's not the first, and won't be the last, were his exact words. Thinking back on it now, I wish I would have thought to ask, Are you okay? To that man that we passed on our way down. Hell, I wish I would have said anything other than just hello. I don't know what led that man up there that evening, but it still gives me chills knowing that we were likely the last people to see him alive. This all happened a good six months back now. My girlfriend was staying at her parents that night, so I, a 27-year-old male, was at the flat alone. About 3 a.m., I'm woken up out of a dead sleep by a loud slam. I quickly jolt up. My bedroom door is wide open and I see a bald man walk straight past my room and into the living room. I must have forgotten to lock the front door that night, is all I could think. I jumped out of bed and immediately made the decision to go plant myself in front of the front door. I figured there's only one way out and if he's taken anything, I can try to stop him. In my haste, 
had also made the subconscious decision not to put on any clothes so I could get to the door quicker. And this left me standing in my foyer, completely naked. Not important to the story, just a semi-amusing aspect of it. Anyway, the dude comes stumbling back to the door, has a handful of loose cans of Stella Artois cradled in his arms, a half-smoked cigarette in his mouth, and a plastic shopping bag hanging from one of his hands. I asked what he was doing in my flat, to which he replied, I'm really sorry, I'm, I'm so sorry, though he could hardly get his words out. It was clear that he was absolutely drunk out of his mind. I asked him to show me the contents of his bag, which didn't have any of our stuff in it, before proceeding to let him out of the flat, making sure to lock the door this time. I'm assuming he was just out of his mind on whatever, and walked into the wrong apartment. One funny detail though, there was a point where one of the cans slipped from his grip, and he had to bend down to pick it up, making him directly eye level with my bare waist. It was a very awkward moment, and I'm sure the poor guy doesn't remember, so I'm hoping that he hasn't been completely scarred. Anyway, I got back into bed and could hardly sleep the rest of the night, my heart still absolutely thumping. I will say, it gave me some confidence in my fight or flight response. You never really know what you'll be like in this sort of situation. And I was rather proud after the fact that I blocked his exit. I'm perhaps not the most masculine of men, so that was some nice affirmation. Completely true story, by the way. One of the most terrifying moments of my life, seeing a stranger casually stroll into my living room in the dead of night. But it also makes me feel good to know that when stuff hits the fan, I won't just hide under the blankets. I do hope that guy made it to his real destination that night. This happened relatively recently, and I thought it best to share while all the details are still fresh in my mind. I, a 23-year-old male university student, was driving home from work and decided that I wanted a pizza. I pulled into the local pizza shop near home, Saturday night, and it's pretty busy, staffed by three young women. When I say young women, I'm talking like teenagers. I don't know how it is elsewhere in the world, but working at a pizza shop here in Australia is very much a get paid cash after school type of job. As I'm ordering, the girl taking the order is super distracted, like she's looking right past me at something that I'm not aware of. But as I'm trying to pay, she yells out to the two other girls prepping and cooking something like, Oh, thank God, Matt is back. Pseudonym for the internet, because I don't really remember the name that she said. As she said this, an employee that looked to be the delivery boy walked into the store, but pretty much came in and straight away did a 180 turn, taking more pizzas and leaving. I pay and turn to sit and wait, and that's when I see what the girl had been looking at behind me. Standing next to the entryway door, peering through the shop face window, is a visibly terrifying man. He was about 5'10", in his late 20s or early 30s, rat-like, pudgy, unnaturally pale with dark spots under his eyelids, long and greasy dark hair, and sharp-looking, almost cylindrical teeth. Weirdly, I thought, hmm, maybe that's her mate but obviously I got bad vibes. My initial reaction was just confusion at the sight of him through the window. At this point, another guy comes in to pick up some pizzas, pretty much right as I sit down, and the girl freezes up while serving him too. But this time she apologizes and says something like, sorry, I'm a bit distracted because this guy won't stop coming to my job and staring at me through the window. My boss banned him, but he comes back whenever he's gone. I take a proper look at the window guy now, and he's pointing at her and waving while making other weird gestures with his hands. This instantly made me very uncomfortable, so without really thinking, I went outside to confront the guy about what he was doing. I had a fair bit of adrenaline pumping and don't really remember what I said, but it was like, you have to leave, you're scaring the workers. He just stared at me 
and did this weird wheeze in exasperation. It was about as dismissive as a wheeze could be. Then, through a whiny voice, he said, I'm not doing anything. I said, you're being a creep, and you're banned. Get out of here. And then I walked back in. The creep stormed off, and I thought it was solved. The girl thanked me and asked what he had said. I said he didn't really say anything, and she explained the things that she had to the other guy before, but also explained that the window guy had said some really lewd and gross things to her in the past. Just as I'm sitting back down, the guy comes back in with a bank card in his hand. I said, what did I just tell you? Get out of here. But he makes a beeline straight to the counter and orders a pizza. The girl froze up, but I could tell that she made the choice to put through his order because she was scared of how he would react if she didn't. Then he came and sat down right next to me and said, see, if she didn't want me here, she wouldn't have let me get the pizza. It gets a bit hazy for me here because this is where all the trauma happened, but I'm pretty sure that I told him that he was disgusting and this led to him being enraged. He stood up, bent towards me and screamed, I haven't done anything wrong. What did I do? I'm a good boy. I've got a good heart. Tell me. Tell me what I did. How would you feel if someone said stuff like that about you? It's whack because even though I saw exactly what he had been doing and the effect it had had on the teenage girl at the counter, I felt like I was wrong for telling him to stop. He was right up close to me now, yelling, full on raging out, and I wasn't sure what he was going to do next. I just kept my eyes locked on his and tried to look like I wasn't afraid of him, while also anticipating any incoming acts of violence. He was steadfast with his screaming. It's at this point, the eldest of the workers came from the kitchen and said, stop yelling. If you're going to yell, you have to leave. He halted his tirade and his entire demeanor changed. Now he was rather jovial and consolatory. He put his fist out to fist bump me, and he's going, you're a good guy, I can tell, or something to that effect. I wouldn't bump him, and he sat back down. Now he was just talking at me, blabbering and the like. Wasn't really listening at this point, but I did tell him that I didn't want to talk. The girl he had been targeting was just staring with these big freaked out eyes. They fast tracked his pizza and tried to send him on his way. Once he got out the door, he began talking to this really big guy and was now pointing at me through the window. I spoke to the girl and she thanked me profusely even though I didn't really do anything. I actually felt like I had made it worse. She said she gets really freaked out because he comes by when none of the male workers are at the shop. She also said that the guy had found her on Facebook and had been incessantly sending her messages. I told her to make sure that her parents knew and maybe to tell the police. Turns out that the big guy at the front was the owner of the shop. The girl had called him and he'd come back to the store. He finished talking to the guy and went back behind the counter. But afterwards, after taking a few feet away from the door, the creeper let out the longest guttural and rage-filled scream I've ever heard. I'm guessing his ban had been re-explained to him. I genuinely worry that maybe the workers weren't taking this guy's behavior and fixation on this teenage girl as the dangerous threat that it is. He was unreasonable and irrational, and just all around, one of the creepiest people I've encountered in a while. He had this energy to him, this sort of juvenile malignancy, who knows what he's capable of. I've thought about that young woman a few times in these last few weeks, although I have no idea where this went from here. I'm just glad that that night, while I was present, it never had the chance to escalate further. I've gone back and forth, debating on whether I would post this here, but the more I think about it, the more unsettled I actually feel. For background, I'm a 23-year-old woman, and I live in my city alone. There's a bar down the road for me where I sometimes go after work to have a much-needed drink. The other day, when my car was in the shop, 
and I was in the mood to chill at the bar and eat some greasy food. I texted my friend and asked if she wanted to meet me there. She said yes and offered me a ride, but I knew that she had obligations she needed to get to and wouldn't be able to stay long. I told her that I was fine. I would call myself a cheap Uber to get home when the time came. As soon as my friend leaves the bar, this man, bald, tall, skinny, probably in his mid-sixties, comes over and immediately takes her seat. At this point, I'm waiting on the to-go order that I made, and I was actively searching for an Uber. I was having a difficult time finding one, and he had to be watching my frustration because he asked, can't find a ride? To which I reply, I'm trying to find an Uber and it's just taking longer than I'm used to. Oh, do you live close? I can take you. Mm, no thank you man, I'll wait for my Uber. Minutes later, he tells me that he found me a lift and they'll be there in four minutes. I tell him that I'm gonna find my own Uber, but thank you for the concern. Five minutes pass and I can feel his eyes boring into me. He receives a phone call, and once he gets my attention, he says that it's from the Lyft driver, and he lets me know that they're there, if I'm still interested, and want a ride. Once more, I decline. At this point, my order has arrived and I'm out the door. I walk out and find an Uber relatively quickly after the fact, while waiting on the sidewalk and I didn't think too much about this interaction as I was just happy to get home. But the more I think about it, this man was so adamant about getting me a lift, but he didn't even know where I was going. What was the destination for that ride? I'm thanking that inner feeling that I got that told me not to accept a ride from that man or whoever he had arranged that lift with. This story took place in the year 2003, when I was a 14-year-old girl, still living in my home country of Uruguay. My best friend at the time, same age as me, was my neighbor, who lived with her mother and grandmother three houses down from mine. We had been friends since we were babies, we grew up together, went to the same school, moved in the same social circle, went on vacation together, shared clothes, CDs, food, we were basically sisters. Our families were that close. Her mom, early 30s at the time, was a single mom working as a secretary. They didn't have it too bad. Between her salary and the grandmother's pension, they lived comfortably and without any major setbacks. Her mom started seeing a foreign guy who was in the country for business. He claimed to be from Spain, but he had a funny accent as if he was originally from Italy or another non-Spanish-speaking country. He was allegedly rich. Despite staying in a rinky-dink hotel, he would often show pictures of himself in a very luxurious residence. He said it was his house in Ibiza. Pictures of him driving a red sports car, a photo of him in front of the Eiffel Tower, and so on. After a month and a half or so of dating, my friend's mom said they were leaving the country in perhaps the next six to seven months. She was in love with this guy, and he had promised her a life of luxury in Europe, and everything was going to be perfect. The country they were moving to? Spain. Her and her daughter. The grandmother couldn't come. At least not yet. She was supposed to join them in the future, after they had settled in. But, at the same time, wasn't he rich? There were lots of red flags from the get. This is where I come in. Since I was such good friends with Maritza, the guy had told Maritza's mom to bring me along for vacation, that it would be good for Maritza and make the transition easier. I was of course thrilled. A month in Europe with my best friend who was moving away. The idea of going to see her every summer and stay at her stepfather's mansion it was kind of a dream. My parents of course weren't so thrilled at first. But as they got to know him, they liked him, and eventually, he had won them over too. Soon, I had gotten a little weekend job as a waitress at my uncle's restaurant, 
to help my parents with the plane ticket and other costs. We got my passport. We were ready to go. As the months went by, it became evident that I wasn't going to be able to go. The money I'd saved wasn't enough. It didn't even cover half of the ticket. My parents couldn't come up with the money for the rest of the trip. A week or so before they left, the guy came to my house and spoke to my parents. He offered to pay for my entire plane ticket. My parents politely declined. I was fuming. I swore I would never talk to my parents again. I didn't come out of my room for days. Although I eventually got over it. By the time that the day had arrived to take Maritza and her family to the airport and say goodbye. We cried. We hugged. We promised each other that we would meet up next summer. By then I would already have the money saved. They left, and we never heard from them again. First days went by, then weeks, then months, and nothing. I remember the grandmother, the pain on her face, the night she went on without sleeping, home alone without her daughter and granddaughter, who were supposed to call her as soon as they arrived in Spain, and yet they never did. Ultimately, they were reported as missing. Surprisingly enough, the guy had given out his real name. So after the cops got involved, turns out he had this huge record in Spain and Italy and had been in jail for drugs, prostitution, kidnapping, extortion, and only God knows what else. The police told the family that they were most likely sold into a human trafficking ring, that this was very common, and that sadly there were too many cases like it and there was nothing that we could do, except wait. Last time anyone saw them, or had any account of them at all, was at the airport in Sevilla, Spain, when they arrived, but nothing else. It breaks my heart to this day, and to think that if my parents had said yes, I likely wouldn't be here as well, since chills down my spine, actually. Sometimes I look Maritza up on Facebook, in hopes that I'll find her. Maybe she regained her life and her freedom, but nothing ever shows up. Her grandmother died in 2013 too. Sadly, without ever seeing or hearing about her daughter and granddaughter again. This story has always bothered me. In my head, I know what I saw, but at the same time, it just felt all so unreal. When I was around 10 years old, I had been invited to a sleepover for the first time at my friend's house. This friend, whom I'll call Abby, lived pretty far away from us, so anytime we got to hang out, it felt like a special occasion. I had just started becoming brave enough to sleep away from my parents, and because she was one of my oldest friends, Abby's house was going to be one of these trial run sleepovers. A little about Abby's family. She's the youngest of four kids. Her oldest brother, who is about 10 years older than us, has pretty severe autism and continues to live full time with Abby's parents. He was always a bit of a wild card, and I, as a 10 year old girl, always felt just a little anxious around him. Anyway, there are three of us girls at the slumber party. We decided to sleep on the main floor of her house so that we could stay up late watching movies that would eventually lull us to sleep. I had chosen the couch that was perpendicular to the wall of windows, looking out onto Abby's deck and backyard. The other girls had set up on the floor, on a mattress together. We throw in a DVD, and we all quickly fall asleep. Sleeping away from home has never been easy for me. I wake up frequently and sometimes I can't fall asleep at all to begin with. This night was one of those times where, after clocking a solid two hours, something stirred me back to consciousness. Coming to, I noticed the bright light of the TV glowing first before my eyes adjusted and noticed something outside that hadn't been there before. It was a person. A man, actually. He was sitting in one of the deck chairs and... He'd positioned it to face directly towards where the three of us were sleeping. He hadn't noticed that I was awake, but seeing him made my heart race. 
I stayed absolutely still, just watching. It was dark, and so his features were a bit ambiguous, but I could tell that he was studying us and smirking. Terrified, I watched him for a few minutes before turning myself into the couch cushion and closing my eyes. Some time passed, maybe a few minutes, maybe half an hour, before I finally mustered up the courage to look again, only to see that he was now gone. To this day, I have no idea who it was that had gotten into Abby's backyard and sat on our deck watching us in the middle of the night. But the image of him sitting there, grinning, still haunts me. For a while I thought it may have been her brother or her father, but this guy had dark hair and even darker eyes, and all her family members were blonde. We all survived the night unharmed, but as I recounted what I had seen to my friends and Abby's parents, I was met with quizzical looks and reassurances that I had probably not seen what I thought I saw. That's the story of the first and last time that I ever spent the night at Abby's house. In my younger days, I had a church acquaintance who we'll call Matthew for the sake of this story. He was popular, funny, charismatic, and attractive. I myself had once been interested in him, but by this point I knew better. He was flirty with everyone, and I wasn't into being one of the many. We were all back in town for a break over a holiday from school. It was cold, and we ended up at a rental house near downtown, in a rather sketchy neighborhood. The party itself wasn't terribly memorable. My best friend, Faith, had ended up in Matthew's lap, some kissing, but still out in a main room. Both of them had appeared to drink too much, so at this point, we decided that we were going home. Faith had already had some very bad stuff happen to her while drinking, so I was getting a bit concerned when I saw her so drunk. Matthew, I thought, was helping me walk her out to my car when he offered to give her a ride home because she lived closer to him. I told him no, I would take her home. He stopped his march in the middle of the street, holding onto her arm, damn near tugging her away from me. It was obvious that he wanted to take her. I held her other arm for dear life. Again, I directly told him that I'd be taking her home. I made a pretty firm declaration that she came with me and she wouldn't be leaving without me. And this is when things got weirder. Matthew's face twisted and contorted as he went through every human emotion trying to convince me to let him take her. From trying to peer pressure me, begging with tears in his eyes, to downright anger, pulling with each approach. If I hadn't seen it, I don't know that I would have believed a person could be so fake, but it weirded me out to no end and reinforced that there was something very, very off about him. I think we stood in the road arguing over her for five to ten minutes. Once he had given it all he had, he abruptly gave up, and I hustled to get her in my car, and far, far away from him. I dropped her off as planned, drove home myself just a bit shaken, but it did bring to mind all of the other crazy things that he had previously stated he had done, from being unkind to animals, to whispering extremely inappropriate things in our ears and others ears during church to get us to react. He had started fires and the list just goes on and on. His mom escaped his abusive biological father and changed their last names. But the real kicker for me was when I found out he was pursuing an occupation in medicine that pretty much controls if you live or die in surgery. To say I was disturbed, probably a huge understatement. The next day, I checked in with my friend to ask if she remembered what he did that night, or how things felt to her. She vaguely remembered a struggle, but that was all. The alcohol had erased a lot of it. I ended up moving across the country, and so did Matthew, so I didn't have to be in any contact with him. I warned all my friends because they still ran into him from time to time during the holidays. I wish I could have warned the world, though. At the time, 
the cycling through every single emotion for minutes on a freezing night, trying to get my practically passed out friend into his car to do whatever he wanted. It felt chilling and evil. And to this day, it's one creepy encounter that I won't ever soon forget. I now have a lot of distance from the situation, so I finally feel comfortable posting about it. When I lived in Boulder, Colorado, I was living in a motel-style, off-campus apartment building. It was mostly students living there, and I was on the first floor. Standard layout for a small studio apartment. There was a kitchenette, a dining nook, and there was one large window. The window was actually above my bed just for a little context. There were many signs that I had a stalker watching me for months before I fully realized the situation that I was in. It started with a few stolen packages here and there, a disposable camera stolen from my car, a random movie poster left in my car that absolutely none of my friends had ever seen before, and most notably, a man in a bright orange hoodie with his hood up, walking back and forth past my living room window maybe 20 times in one day. I was on the phone with my boyfriend when I first noticed him. I made a comment about it, but I figured that I was overreacting. Two months after I first noticed him, my boyfriend happened to be out of town with his family on a trip, so I was watching his dog for him. I woke up earlier than normal to go walk her, maybe around 6 a.m. Afterwards, I laid in bed on my phone. At one point around 6.30, I looked up from my phone, and the same man in the same bright orange hoodie was standing right over my bed, looking at me through the window. We were basically a foot apart, the wall and the window being the only things between us. I was frozen in shock, and he didn't leave. He continued to stare at me for about 30 seconds, and then simply walked off. I immediately hid under my bed and phoned the police. I put two and two together and realized all of these coincidences probably weren't coincidences. And he may have been coming by to watch me sleep every morning and possibly every night for months. This was the first time I acknowledged him and he seemed excited by it. The police told me to close all my blinds and to get a camera. Thanks for the help, I guess. They said this was common in Boulder, considering both the high student and high homeless population. The man didn't look homeless, though. He also didn't fit the description of anyone who lived in my building. The police officers had checked with my building manager. So that meant he was coming from somewhere else, specifically just to watch me sleep. I did as I was told, closed all my blinds, but about two hours after the police officers left, he came back and banged on my window after trying to open my door, which was always automatically locked. I was terrified. I called the police again and left town to go be with my boyfriend and his family for the next few days. When I got back, I never planned to stay at my apartment alone at night, but I figured I could unpack my things as it had been a few days and he probably noticed that I was gone. Within the hour of me being back, so was he, and this time, he held up a camera through the one crack in my blinds that I had, and he also held up a knife behind the camera, slowly walking by, making sure that I saw. Oh, I saw all right. I called the police for a third and final time. They made an official police report, and I moved out of my apartment within the week. I never saw that man again, but from time to time, I did check my old apartment's reviews on Google because they tried to charge me $1,800 to leave while knowing about the situation, which I thought was absolutely insane. Colorado laws protect stalking victims from these fees though, so big middle finger to my property managers. Anyway, I checked recently, considering what the Idaho killer had been up to and how much it reminded me of my own situation. I saw a review about a man chasing girls around with a knife and the building doing absolutely nothing about it. It was from a parent, and I reached out to her personally on Facebook. 
The same man in the bright orange hoodie had attacked her daughter in the parking lot at 4 a.m. with a knife. He tried to stab her as she was getting into her car, stabbed her car when he failed to get her, and tried to slash her tires as she began to escape. In case you're wondering, he's still out there. When I was in high school, I had a strange encounter riding my bike home from work. When I was a senior, I worked at a Target store from about 4 p.m. until 10 p.m., four to five nights a week. After helping close the store, zero out the registers, and other final closing tasks, my coworkers and I were usually out of the building and on our ways home before about 10.30. The store was not too far from a bike path that also went close to my home. It took me maybe 15 to 20 minutes to ride my bike home from work, down that bike path, in a large subdivision. At about the midway point home, there was a section of the bike trail that went through an undeveloped field and was very poorly lit. I remember slowing down to change the radio station on my CD Walkman slash radio. Yeah, I know I'm dating myself here. When suddenly, I see a dark figure about 100 feet away on my right hand side, begin running at me from the dark field. While I saw no features on this dark mass, it was obvious that they were the size of a large human being and they were barreling down on me, quickly. Fight or flight instantly kicked in and I started riding my 18 speed mountain bike so fast, I felt like I could have qualified for the Tour de France. As I was escaping, I took a quick peek behind and saw that it was a man in black attempting to chase me for more than a few moments. As I put more and more distance between me and this man, I saw him halt his sprint and retreat silently back into the field. Needless to say, what would normally be a 15 to 20 minute bike ride turned into a five minute top speed and top gear bike ride home. I obviously didn't sleep very well that night and I still occasionally think about that encounter in my darker moments. The two main questions that fill my mind are, what did they want? And what would they have done had they caught me? I'm glad to not find out the answer to either one of those in this lifetime. My mom was born and raised in the high country of East Central Montana. Much of the area that she grew up in was flat grassland that stretched on for miles and miles. The only other accompanying feature would be a farmer's fence with barbed wire between the slats. She came from ranching people and her father, my grandfather, was a genuine cowboy. She often did work around the ranch with him so not much shakes her to her soul. Except for what happened when she had to run into town when I was only eight months old. So you know, this story occurred in the middle of a sunny summer day. The ranch that she was raised on was nearly two hours away from the nearest town. To get there, you had to drive north on a highway for 30 minutes, then you had to drive on a dirt road for another 45 across the Montana high country. I'm emphasizing this because it not only shows how far into nowhere she lived at the time, but it plays into why this story becomes so disturbing. My mom had to run into town to get groceries and baby supplies for me. She was driving on the long and isolated dirt road back to the ranch when she reaches into her purse on the passenger seat to get something. It slips out of her hand and falls into the passenger footwell. Fair enough. She then has to stop the car so she can safely retrieve what she dropped. She grabs it, and as soon as she sits back up, she looks in the rearview mirror and sees a man about 100 feet behind the car, running directly for her. Needless to say, she puts the car back into gear and gets the hell out of there. As she's looking back at me in the car seat, making sure that I'm okay, she sees the guy give up running after her and run back into the ditch to hide. Of course, when she gets home, she tells her mom and dad, my grandparents, about what had happened, and they're all stunned. 
Here's where it gets disturbing, at least psychologically. My mom didn't see any cars or trucks parked along that dirt road for the entire way back to the ranch. She also didn't see any people walking along the highway or the dirt road, which only raises more questions. How did he get out there? Why was he out there? And even more, what would he have done to my mom or an eight month old me? The more I thought about it, the more disturbing it became. That's a direct quote from my mother. I've only asked her about this story twice. After the second time, she tells me to never ask her about it again. And I completely get why. I get messed up thinking about it myself. I can only imagine how she felt having directly experienced it. So again, this occurred way out in the middle of nowhere. It's wide open, flat grassland with low rolling hills. The only traces of human activity you'll find out there are the fence posts, maybe a windmill. I'm emphasizing this because some people might ask why my mom just didn't call the police. To that, I say, what police? There are police in the small town where she got her groceries, but out where she was? Good luck. This is the main reason why people who live out there carry firearms. If something happens out there, you might have to deal with it in the moment. I'll let you read into that however you may. Second, some people might point out that there's an interesting coincidence that my mom happened to stop her car near where the guy was hiding. Again, coincidences happen and weird things happen out in the middle of nowhere. But who knows why that guy was out there in the first place. Rural Montana is not a place where you go casually to hang out, unless you actually live out there. Know someone who lives out there? or have some business with someone out there, you shouldn't be going there for any reason. On top of how she didn't see anyone walking on the highway or the dirt road, didn't see any vehicles parked along the side of the road, any person who made it out that far on foot for some reason is probably not anyone you should be interacting with. My mom was a petite 19 year old woman with her eight month old infant in the back seat when this all happened. At best, I highly doubt she could have been any help to him if he needed assistance. At worst, well, that's another story. We'll never really know why this guy was out there. And frankly, I don't think we ever want to. This happened around six years ago. My family owns a flower and produce shop and we travel to farmer's markets sometimes. Most of the family are not well enough to pick the garden or do heavy loading, so we often have to hire people for the summers. My uncle hired this guy, who we'll call Kevin. Kevin was in his late 30s, maybe early 40s, and down on his luck. He was going through a divorce and needed some extra income. He was very nice, almost too nice. He was actually camping on our land because his ex-wife-to-be was to have their house. At this time, I was 16 or 17 years old. Well, one day, we were working the farm. During a break, he tracked me down in the office, where no one else happened to be at that time. He gave me his card with his personal number on it, if I ever wanted to hang out. He was very insistent that we should do it that day after work, actually, and kept nagging me and nagging me for my phone number. I was immediately creeped out by this, politely told him we would see, just to get him away from me. I want to clarify right now that he knew I was underage. I immediately told my mom, who kind of brushed it off, but he gave me off vibes, that sort of feeling like... Mm, you're okay to be around when other people are there, but I definitely don't want to be alone with you. A few days after this, he no-called, no-showed to work. We called a few times, went by his camper, but there was no sign of him anywhere. After no contact whatsoever, we read in the newspaper a day or two later that he had crashed his ex-wife's birthday celebration and tried to unalive her with his own hands. She drove to the nearest police station, and he gave chase. Actually, 
crashing into parked police cars in his haste. Fast forward to this day, he's still in prison, and I'm still glad that I didn't have to hang out with him. Listen to your gut, everybody. It won't lead you astray. Back when I, a woman, was in college, University of Texas, my roommates, who included another girl and two guys, all decided to drive to Boulder, Colorado for spring break. To maximize our time, we decided to take shifts and drive all the way through, rather than stopping for overnight stays along the way. It was roughly set to be an 18-hour trip. So I'm driving my shift when we reach the Texas Panhandle in the early morning hours. We're out in the middle of nowhere, and I've not seen a single car in either direction for ages, when we notice headlights behind us. The car came upon us quickly, and then followed behind for some time. Oddly, it would get real close to us, then back off real far, and then ramp up to get close again. This pattern continued for several miles. We were in the car nervously joking about it being a potential deliverance situation set in Texas flatland. Suddenly, the headlights are joined by red and blue police lights. It was so dark out that we hadn't seen the light bar on the hood and hadn't realized we were being followed by a cop. I check my speedometer and I'm not speeding, so we're all wondering why we're getting pulled over in the first place. But I go ahead and pull over to the shoulder. Up comes a cop wearing a cowboy hat to my window. He shines his light in the car and looks us over, then proceeds to ask me to get out of the car. I hesitate at first, but there are three other people in the car with me, so I'm not feeling particularly unsafe at this point. I grab my wallet, get out, and stand against the driver's side door. The cop looks at my license and insurance, then tells me he's going to do a sobriety test. I'm thinking, what the fuck? But I know that I've had nothing to drink, so I say okay. The way the cop directed me for the walking in a straight line test had me ending my walk right by his car. When I finished, he reached over to open his back passenger side door and told me to get in. Me. What? Why? Cop. Sit in the car while I look up your license. Now, I had heard how doors on the back of a cop car only open from the outside. So I know if I get in this car and he closes the door, I won't be able to get back out. It's like 3 a.m., pitch black darkness on a road dozens of miles from any civilization. I'm not getting in that car. Me. I'm sorry, sir, with all respect, and for my own safety, I don't want to get in the back of your car. The cop, with more than just a tinge of anger spreading across his face, says, what did you say to me? Me. For my own safety, and with all respect, I'm not sitting in the back of your car. You can call for another officer to come out here, but I don't feel safe getting in your car. Cop only proceeds to get angrier. Do you realize I could arrest you right now for not obeying an order from a police officer? Me repeating again. Sir, I'm not meaning to be disrespectful, but I'm not getting into your car. We go back and forth like this for several minutes. Him threatening to arrest me, my friends, hold us overnight, etc etc. And me refusing to budge on my insistence to not get into his car. The cop then leers at me and asks, what, are you afraid of being kidnapped? All right, what the fuck? How messed up is that to even ask? I glance towards my car and see my friends piled up at the back window, watching, the two guys looking ready to jump out. The cop turns to look at them too. I don't know what went through his mind, but after being completely aggressive with me for what seemed like forever. He finally gave me a creepy smile, handed back my license and insurance, tipped his hat, got back into his own car and drove off. At this point, I was shaking so badly that my friends had to help me back to the car. I don't even remember if he gave me a ticket or not. I was glad that I maintained my composure and had not cried in front of this asshole but I totally broke down once in the back seat. To this day, I think about this 
Ed deciding to terrorize a young college female at 3 a.m. in the middle of rural Texas, and often wonder what would have happened if I had not stood my ground, and instead gotten into that damn cop car. This all happened a few years ago, but upon discovering the sub, it reminded me of that incident, and I wanted to share. The year 2018, me and three other friends, all males in our early 20s, decided to travel to Bali for about a week, since it was cheap and we had time. So why not? Our itinerary included sightseeing, trying local foods, mountain climbing, visiting bars at the beach, basically a typical vacation in Indonesia. It was honestly quite a surreal experience. The country is absolutely beautiful and the food was amazing. The only issue I had about the trip were the locals. Drugs were prominent there, especially mushrooms. The streets were filled with druggies, dying to sell their drugs. I'm not exaggerating when I say this. One dude even grabbed my arm because I ignored his two for one deal for a one-way trip to meet Jesus. I shrugged him off while my friends laughed, suggesting that I may be passing up a chance to meet our Lord and Savior. He looked rabid and frantic, like he was about to pounce on me like a dog diagnosed with rabies. I wasn't too fearful though. We were confident that we could handle the dealers since half of them didn't even look like they were sober. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. The horror starts when we went back to our Airbnb for the night. We had an early day the next morning and were all exhausted. The place was extremely cheap and it didn't even have a proper locking mechanism for the door. It had two wooden doors which swung inwards and the only way to lock them was to wedge a wooden block through the holes mounted on the door. It was quite a primitive lock but it gets the job done, I guess. Everything was going well until the last night of our trip when we realized that the wooden block was missing. We looked everywhere for it, but to no avail. Because we didn't have much to fit the holes in the door, we ended up using a selfie stick. I know, it sounds like a horrible idea even as I type it. We turned in for the night, seemingly not expecting anything since we had already stayed there for six days with no issues. I woke up to strange clicking sounds in the dead of night. I got out of my bed and thought maybe it's one of the guys, so I nonchalantly approached the noise. My friends were all sleeping, so I decided to investigate the cause of the noise myself. The ruckus seemed to be coming from the door, so that's where I went, beginning to feel an air of confusion as I stepped. Who could be at our doorstep this time of night? I noticed the doors were slightly opened and the selfie stick was horribly deformed. I peeked outside and saw three people staring through the gap between the doors. They were really close to the entrance and were attempting to push it open. I yelled at them, questioning their intentions, as I noticed one of them was holding that wooden block. I was shocked and puzzled at the situation, as I recognized one of the men. He did the general cleaning for the Airbnbs and pathways during the day, so there's no reason for him to be there at 3 a.m. The other dude asked if the wooden block belonged to us as they allegedly found it outside of our unit. I definitely smelled bullshit in the air, as there was no reason for them to do this at 3 a.m. I called for my guys, and the three men immediately ran for it. I clue in my friends on the circumstances, and we stayed up until the morning, in case they tried anything funny. We decided to report to the reception about their employee, but the description that I gave them? Well, they said that they don't have any employees that match that. They told me the housekeepers they hired consisted of only females in their late 30s and early 40s. This sent shivers down our spines as we came to realize that we had let a complete imposter in and out of our rooms while we were out. Luckily, nothing important was lost and we got out of the situation safely. I can't imagine what would have happened if I didn't wake up on that fateful night as the doors were close to being opened. I was just grateful that it was our last night there and that I'm such a light sleeper. So me, my husband, my daughter, my niece all went camping this weekend. 
We've camped at this place four times and never had any issues. Last night, we were setting up and about to start making dinner. This was around 8 p.m. When my daughter looks at me, looks behind me, looks back at me once more. I said, what? She said, look behind you. There's a little kid, couldn't be more than six years old, just standing there, watching my daughter and niece play with a soccer ball. I figured he was there camping too and just interested in what they were doing. My daughter invites him to play and he runs back into the woods like he got scared. I didn't think much of it, but after not seeing him for 15 minutes or so, I figured that he went back to his own campsite. But then he comes back, and at this point, it's dark outside. So he asks where his parents were. He responds in a very cold and matter-of-fact way. I don't have any parents. This leaves me a little bit confused. My husband asked if he was camping here, and at this point he screamed at my husband, my parents are dead, and I'm homeless, I sleep in the woods. I said, oh, okay, well that's not safe at all, buddy, I'm going to call someone to help you. He said, please call them, I don't have a family. So I start to call the non-emergency police line. I gave him some food and a Gatorade and told him to hang out until help got there. Cops arrive in about 10 minutes. They start trying to talk to him. And at this point, he takes off running back into the woods and yells that his brother will be back for us. Cops chased after him. No idea what happened after that, but I didn't sleep a wink last night. It was the creepiest thing I've ever dealt with in my life. And it involved a child as the focal point. There's no houses within 10 miles of here. I'm really worried about him, but also just so creeped out about the brother thing. Update. And unlike most stories, this actually has a resolution. The child was a runaway from his new foster home. His quote, sleeping in the woods, means they've also been camping. Did confirm that his parents had passed away. No mention of a brother that the police or foster home know of. No idea why he ran from the police in the first place. My guess is that he got scared. This may have been a much creepier situation had it been left as a cliffhanger, but I'm also glad that this kid isn't alone sleeping in the woods like some feral child, and I hope that he sticks close to his foster parents and doesn't run off to give another family a panic attack of sorts. This had to have happened about 10 years ago. I think I was about 27, and I'm a female for background information. My boyfriend at the time was in a band, and we stayed in this converted garage. Not really converted, it was still very much a garage. Concrete walls, damp, but we made do. It was also on a service lane, it's like a street that has businesses down it, and the back of houses. He had come home very early that morning and gone straight to bed. His bandmate was living in a bus at the time, which was parked out the front, as they stored the gear next to our flat in another garage. I woke up at around 5 a.m., hearing screams, mainly from a woman, but also very aggressive shouting from a man. Think along the lines of, I'm going to kill you, and so on. The area we were in was not the nicest, although now the area is hot property not far from the beach, boutique shops, etc. But this was coming from a house that I thought was condemned. Two stories, dilapidated, torn curtains, rotten wood, and about five broken down cars in the front yard that had been picked apart. Turns out that someone was living there the whole time. I woke up and went straight to the front door, saw a man stomping around a parked car on the side of the road, chasing a woman in her pajamas, threatening to kill her all the while. She was screaming, crying, and pleading for her life. Out of instinct, I screamed something like, Oi, what the f*** is going on over there? I'm gonna call the cops. They both stopped and looked at me, in my pajamas, standing near my door, barefoot. The man had a full leather jacket, pants and boots, half a face tattoo, and even though he was across the street, 
I could see the whites of his eyes. He was obviously on something and furious. I'm going to kill you too, he shouted back at me, in motion cutting of the neck with his thumb. When he had turned to me, the woman escaped to the abandoned looking house and locked the door behind her. I, being brave and stupid, replied, come on then, as I grabbed a large plank of two by four that I kept behind the door. I found this area rather sketchy and would be at home alone a lot on the weekends. I'd never used my two by four, but I felt better having it there. I stepped further outside with my pajamas and leopard print robe with the block of wood over my shoulder while on the phone to the police. I'm not the smallest woman in the world. I must have been around 170 pounds and 5 foot 10 inches tall. But I think he would have taken me out if he wanted. I think the idea of the police made him second guess it. He got the hint and quickly took off down the street. My boyfriend nor the other bandmates stirred from their slumber. I was pretty angry at both of them. I seemed to be the only one who had the balls to do anything about this. Another lady across the road came out also, and we talked about our menfolk not doing anything about it. Her husband had stayed in bed too. Later on that week, a lady came to my house thanking me for helping her niece. That that man was some crazy, cracked out guy that had fallen in love with her, and just wouldn't take no for an answer. He had come to her house without invitation, expecting that she would welcome his drunk and drugged out self with open arms just to get rejected. This of course threw him into a rage, to which he proceeded to kick and beat her while chasing her around the street. About a week later, I was told that he was arrested and taken away on my street. He was led away by police handcuffed with a ciggy hanging out of his mouth. I was glad to hear this, as I was rather terrified that he might come back. And it's possible that I would be alone that night. Always keep your 2 by 4s handy, folks. So I'm going to tell you the story of my brief encounter with a man called Happy. I'm sure it wasn't his birth name, but it adds to the creepy ambiance of the story. Even though it happened around 9 years ago, sometimes he still crosses my mind. Especially on gloomy overcast days in LA just like the day that I met him. 2013, I'm working at a cannabis dispensary in Venice Beach, a block from the boardwalk. A good 30 to 40% of our patrons were unhoused people. Occasionally someone experiencing severe psychosis would try to come in, but if they were screaming or unintelligible, security wouldn't let them. If they had and presented the whole eternity of medical papers, ID, and cash, they were good to go. We had a compassion program where we'd bag up grams of shake left over from bottoms of jars and give them out completely free, one per person, per day, to just about anyone who asked. Word about this spread quickly along the boardwalk. Generally these people would be the nicest, most polite and considerate customers, even if they did smell a bit stinky and their money got pulled out of a sweaty sock. No one working in there would bat an eye if someone came in smelling like they'd slept on the beach for a week next to a bottle of vodka, as long as they just calmly buy their weed and be on their way like any other customer. It's a foggy, chilly day around the holidays, sometime between Thanksgiving and Christmas. Someone had called out, so I was the only person in the back, bud tending. There was another employee at the reception and the security guard at the front door but I'm alone in the back room. There are cameras, but no one's actively watching them. This guy walks in after being checked in at the front. He's the only customer at the moment. And I swear, the whole room gets colder as he walks in. He's wearing a very worn in, deeply faded and wrinkled, conformed to his body, floor length duster jacket, and similarly beaten up wide brimmed leather cowboy hat. It looked like he'd lived and slept in these same clothes for years. We didn't allow hats, hoods, or sunglasses in the store, so I'm surprised that security didn't make him take off his hat at least. This man is about 6'5", and built like a boulder. 
not obese, but pick you up and toss you like a rag doll large. The stench that comes with him is unlike anything I've ever smelt before or since. It was beyond B.O., beyond human excrement. It smelled like actual death, as if he had raw, rotting carcasses tucked under his thick, long leather coat. I thought I had been hardened by plenty of nasty body stank before, but this was absolutely revolting, far beyond anyone who hadn't showered lately or had pissed their pants. I'm trying not to inhale very deeply, and I say, Hi, sir. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Would you mind taking off your hat? It's just store policy. Big customer service smile. What are you looking for today? He grunts deeply. He's walking very slowly, shuffling and dragging his feet. His voice sounds like he gargles with gravel, rough and wet, raw and angry. I don't take off my hat. At this point, I'm not trying to argue with this man about his hat either. Let's just get him in and out. I glance down and see he's not wearing shoes. The bit that I can see from under his coat. One of his ankles is massively purple and black, swollen and melon-sized. The bottoms of both of his feet are bloody and torn up. I realize he's leaving a slight trail of blood as he drags his ragged feet across the concrete floor of the shop. My first thought is how... And why did security let this guy come in? Second, is this guy's obviously seriously injured, and that's concerning as a human being. I'm making sure to keep the display shelf between me and this guy, but that's only about a foot of space, like a bar. He gets to me and the stench just gets stronger. I meekly but sincerely ask, are you all right, sir? His eyes flare up at me. What do you care? In my head, I'm like, well, I tried. Not my chair, not my problem. It's not my monkeys, not my circus. Great, what can I get for you? He pulls up one of his sleeves to expose his forearm. It's covered in large round burns like from a cigar. Some old, some healed, some fresh, pussy, and infected. It's not track marks. It's very clearly burns. He also has a jagged, homemade looking stick and poke tattoo of a smiley face, a crooked circle, two lines for the eyes and scabbed up curve of a smile. He points at this tattoo, happy. My name is happy. The rotting stink was so strong and I needed to breathe little gasps, the least possible. I walked here. I walked all the way here from Pasadena. I say, wow, sir, that's a very long walk. Anyway, what are you looking for today? Just for you, is his only response. His eyes are dark and menacing. He's smeared with a layer of grime, like he lives in the woods, dirty. He doesn't look like the average crust punk or disabled veteran that you generally see on the beach. It was hard to guess his age, but he wasn't that old, or young, somewhere between 30 and 50. He looked like he dragged himself here from his log cabin, like what would happen if you entangled some quantum mechanics poorly and mixed Ed Gein with an 1800s homesteader, then transported him to 2013 Venice Beach. I of course have never seen this man before. Once was more than enough to make him unforgettable though. He keeps staring at me and I move as far back as I can to the wall, hopefully out of his grasp if he lunged. I would need to walk out from behind the case and around him to get the security guard. I'm weighing my options. I decide to grab a bunch of compassion grams, then weigh out an eighth and mark it down that I'd pay for it later, and he's still just leering at me, wheezing, heavy stinking breaths. We actually have a special today, only for people who walked more than 10 miles to get here. This is all for you. On the house, of course. Thanks for stopping by. He accepts the bag, but continues to just stand there and stare at me. Thanks for coming in, Happy. It worked. He grunts a guttural noise that is far from a word and slowly turns to shuffle back towards the door. At the door, he turns back towards me and says, 
I'll see you later. He finally walks out, leaving plenty of his residual stench of death behind. Thank any and all of the gods I did not see happy later, or ever again. When I asked security why they let him in in the first place, he said that when he had noticed his bloody feet, and said, Hey bro, you all good? That looks like it hurts. Happy had stepped up in his face and threatened to choke him out, while using a very tasteless slur. And since it was just the security guard and two 22-year-old, 120-pound girls, he wasn't trying to die tonight, and figured hopefully Happy could just get his stuff and leave. He was watching the cameras in the back, ready to call police and owners if anything got weird. Apparently we had different definitions of weird, but I understood his reaction. And ultimately, we were all fine. Just a bit spooked and creeped out. And now needing to clean blood off the floor with bleach and gloves, texting our bosses that he owed us free weed about it. He quickly agreed and we were able to finish up our evening, clean up, and we all lived happily ever after. Except for Happy. That one? Well, I'm not so sure about that one. This happened about a week ago. I went on a road trip to take a friend of mine home to Colorado. He wanted to fly back, but I really wanted to go on a road trip. I live in Ohio, so we had to go through Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, and Kansas. A 22-hour road trip to get there, not including the rest stops. I'd never traveled this far before in a car. I've flown to Florida once or twice in my life but I didn't see myself getting an opportunity like this in the future. Anyway, I drive most of the way because, well, I love to drive, and no one seemed too concerned with it. The person I was taking home, Travis, said if we needed a switch, it wouldn't be a big deal. At the point where this story kicks off, I had been behind the wheel for nearly 12 hours. Maybe it was because I was tired, even though I didn't feel tired but this is when the creepiest thing occurred. I needed gas, so we found a station in the middle of nowhere pretty much. It was dark aside from the lights by the pump because the service mart for the gas station had closed long ago. I was a bit creeped out by the scene, but I also wasn't concerned because I hadn't had any problems beforehand. So I get out to do my business with no issues. Now, this gas station was different than what I'm used to. To get gas, you do the usual. Select the type you want, but as soon as you pull the nozzle from the pump and into your car, you then had to pull a lever up and then start to pump the gas. It took me a while of fidgeting in order to realize this, but right as I do, I hear a voice call out from beside the closed gas station building. I don't remember exactly what it said, but if I had to guess, it was a, hey, or over here. Definitely male. But when I set the pump to where I don't have to hold the trigger, I look up and saw nothing. Again though, I was tired, so I didn't pay any special attention to it. This was a gas station deserted. But about halfway through the pumping, I hear it again. Another male voice calling out to me. Maybe he thought I was alone, because Travis was sleeping in the back and he had laid the front seat down. Stupid me didn't feel like stopping again, so I ignored it and kept pumping while looking at my phone. Next, I heard this man whistling for me, like I was a dog, and the absolute worst feeling comes over me, something I've genuinely never felt before. It was a mix of fear and oh sh I literally felt my stomach drop. I looked up and sure enough there was a man, dressed in a brown coat, with the hood up, and most unsettling, wearing red shorts. I don't even know how I remembered that, but after I looked up, he let out a scream. Hey, look at me when I'm talking to you. It was so loud that my roommate lying in the back seat shot straight up, rolled the window down. You good? I heard him say. At this point, the man was speed walking towards me, but it was like, as soon as my friend made himself known, 
the stranger turned himself around and booked it back to the back of the building. I heard a car start from there and gravel fly as he obviously took off. I didn't get a look at his car or van or whatever he drove because I was admittedly frozen in place. And I think my friend knew it too. I know a lot of people try to plan for this type of stuff, especially women like me. They have a fully thought out idea as to how to handle it, what they're going to say, where they're going to run, maybe even who to call. Even I did. But when it actually happens, we're clueless, stuck in fear. And that's what I was, stuck. I'm glad my friend let his presence be known when he did. I'm glad that I wasn't alone. After I filled up the car, he took over the drive for me. I don't know what that man wanted or why he was yelling at me or even walking towards me, but I don't ever want to experience something like that ever again.